So culture isn't just culture, it's the environment that we inhabit because culture has been around for so long. And I'll give you one example of that. So a big part of every culture is dominance hierarchy, right? And a dominance hierarchy says who has what access to what at what given time. And pretty much every creature is in a dominance hierarchy. Chickens are in dominance hierarchies. That's the pecking order, right? Members of wolves' packs are in dominance hierarchies. Mem member of, members of chimpanzee troops are in dominance hierarchies. Songbirds are in dominance hierarchies. You know, you hear them sing in the spring. It's all pretty. It's not. A little, little bird is sitting out there saying, I'm healthy and loud. And if you come over here, I'll peck you to death because this is my tree. And so, <laughs> and so the songbirds distribute themselves around the neighborhood by dominance. And the more dominant birds get the better nesting spaces. And better means they don't get rained on, or at least not as much. They, their nests don't get blown out of trees. There's not so many cats around. And they're close to a good food source. And so that makes them attractive to potential mating partners, but it also increases the probability that their chicks will survive. And so, and, and here's, here's the nasty bit of truth that goes along with that. So let's say there's a bunch of birds in the neighborhood and some kind of bird flu that's specific to birds comes wafting through and it's killing birds. Well, the birds die from the bottom of the dominance hierarchy up. And the reason for that is the bottom birds are all stressed out because their life is hard. And when they're stressed, their immune system gets suppressed and you know they're all frazzled from you know being chased by cats and so on and then they die and so the top birds live and the same thing happens in human populations when a plague sweeps through people die from the bottom of the dominance hierarchy up and so dominance hierarchies matter and so birds have them and lizards have them and fish have them so in a school of fish the dominant fish when the fish ball up they do that to make it hard for predators to eat them the big dominant fish are in the middle of that ball. The little sucker, useless fish are on the outside, and that's who gets eaten up when the predators come along. So, and we know that dominance hierarchies stretch back a very long time. So we know, for example, that lobsters live in dominance hierarchies. I told you a little bit about that. And they're about 300 million years old. So what that means is that we've been existing inside a cultural structure because the culture is predicated on a dominance hierarchy, right? That's the patriarchy, if you want to use you know, a politically correct term. That's been around for 300 million years. So to think about it as a permanent constituent element of reality is extremely useful. Because again, here, here's another question for you. Even if you don't buy the sort of meaning argument with regards to categorization, there's another way you can look at it. You might say to yourself, what's most real? That's, that's a tough one. Because, you know, we, we kind of accept gradations of real. Like, rocks seem pretty real, trees seem pretty real. Um, the environment, is that real? That's a harder one, right, because it's an abstraction. How about numbers? Are they real? You can certainly do real things with them once you, once you get numbers, especially zero, which seems not to exist at all. As soon as you get zero, there's all sorts of magical things you can do. So, anyways, my point is it's not all that obvious to figure out what constitutes real. But here's, here's a hint. The longer something has been around, the more real it is. Okay. Dominance hierarchies have been around longer than trees. They're real. They're really, really real. And you live in one. And not only do you live in one, you're really motivated to get to the top of that one or to create one that you can be at the top of because human beings are sneaky, eh? Because if we're not doing so well in the dominance hierarchy, we might think, well, to hell with this dominance hierarchy, we'll just make a new one. And that's what creativity is. So if you're really creative, you can make your own dominance hierarchy and you can sit right at the top of it. And so that's, that's worked out very well for human beings. You know? and in fact, one of the fundamental traits of human beings is openness. And openness is actually a trait that basically assesses the degree to which you're capable of playing around with the rules so you can come up with your own dominance hierarchy. And that's what you do if you're creative, because you make a new set of rules. That's what a creative person does. So it's very sneaky. So it's very important to be up near the top of the dominance hierarchy, because it means you live. That's good. You live without so much stress. That's also good. And your probability of successfully reproducing, or say of having many mating opportunities, goes up, especially in the case of men. It's, it's, like, an ed, it's like an exponential improvement. So if you ever wonder why men are so competitive, that's the reason. It's because the loser men get nothing. 
<laughs> really, that's exactly how it works. And the winner men, they get everything. And there's actually a law that goes behind that, an economic law. You can look it up. It's called the Pareto distribution. You look up the Pareto distribution. It's the law that describes income inequality. So it'll tell you something important about how the world works. And Pareto distribution, which is almost everyone gets nothing and almost no one gets everything, that's a Pareto distribution. It covers the production of everything that's created, money, inventions, art, like music, paintings, you name it. If people creatively produce it, hardly anyone does all of it. And almost everyone does none of it. So it's a really winner-take-all situation. And the dominance hierarchy is set up and really as a reflection of that fact. We also know, for example, just to hammer the point home, is that if you make dominance hierarchy steep, like a steep one is hard to climb, and there's a lot of difference between top and bottom, the steeper the dominance hierarchy in every, any given geographical locale, the higher the murder rate among men. Because they start to kill each other. And the reason they start to kill each other is because that's a good way of attaining dominance if you haven't got any other roots. And so that's the relationship between in income inequality and the destabilization of society. That's an extraordinarily powerful relationship. So, for example, you can describe the steepness of a dominance hierarchy using a statistic called the Gini coefficient. And the correlation between the Gini coefficient and the male homicide rate in North America is about 0.8. And 0.8 is like, okay, you're done. You don't have to figure anything else out. You know why it happens. It just covers it. You never see it. You never see an explanation that complete in psychology. It's like the most powerful effect ever discovered. So, dominance hierarchies. 